Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Woo, let's try that one more time because we got masks on. Say it real loud. Good evening. Good evening. This is so exciting. We're so happy to be here tonight. My name is Megan, and um, we are so excited to have you here at Florist for um, This Is My Brave, the teen show. It's going to be amazing. Um, we are Obviously, we are keeping our capacity smaller than we typically would. However, if there's anyone that feels uncomfortable in this space, we have a fellowship hall just right across the hall with this being streamed live there as well. Okay, so I want you guys to know that you do have that option. Now, some of you are new to Floris, maybe even new to the church, um, but a great tradition in all of humanity is to sing songs together. So we're going to start tonight by asking if you are able to stand in body or in spirit. I would love for you to do that. And if this is a new song for you, feel free to just hum along and sway. But we're going to sing Who You Say I Am, which is a great reminder tonight. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child. This part's so important, so I just wanted us to come back to it. 
please be seated. Wow, what a great way to begin our evening tonight. I am so pleased to see so many of you here. To those of you joining us online, welcome. We are so glad that we could all gather together as this community to talk about such an important topic. I'm so proud. I, I don't even know you, and I'm so pleased that you're brave enough to come and do this. This is, this is something that is near and dear to my heart. If, if you or anyone you know has ever dealt with issues of mental wellness, mental health, mental illness, you know how important this is. So thank you for coming together tonight. You're gonna hear some incredible stories. We are Florence United Methodist Church. I'm Barbara Miner, one of the pastors here. And it is our privilege to host this event. This is my brave. Erin Gallagher brought it to us. She used to be here at the church and they moved to Richmond, poor choice, but you know, <laughs> no, she's still here. Um, but we are so glad to be a part of this. In your programs tonight, there's a lot of great information. There is a link to do a survey, as I understand it, if you can do that. There is also just a lot of information. Um, there is a piece of paper. She has a piece of paper, yes, that you can uh, take this survey. It's got a QR code on it. And that would be really helpful to the team. So if you would do that, that would be great. Um, as we go through the night, um, if you need bathrooms, they're out here to the right or to the left. If you are new to the church, you're very welcome, but that's where they are. And then um, if you see people wandering around, I'm sure they can answer your questions as well, because they're probably from here too. Um, this is Isaiah Park. She is also a pastor here at the church. She's at Restoration mostly. She's also here at Flores, and uh, she has a few words to say as well. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight, because this is so important. And I wanted to open us up in prayer. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this gathering tonight in which we get to think about mental wellness. You desire for us to be healthy and well in our minds, emotions, spirit, and body. You seek for us to be whole in our well-being. So we thank you for a precious evening like tonight where we get to hear these real and genuine stories. Thank you for all the young people who will be courageously sharing their stories and the different performances that they will do. Let what we hear tonight be an inspiration, a strength, and a great blessing. Be with those who speak and perform, and be with those who hear and watch. Let all that we experience tonight be not only for tonight, but an ongoing vital part of raising awareness, seeking healing, and the pursuit of wholeness. Help us to know that we are not alone, but that we are in community with you and with one another. We pray that your Holy Spirit will lead tonight's gathering. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone. We are so glad you're here. I'm going to read from my notes because tonight's kind of an emotional night for all of us. So bear with me. I'm Jennifer Marshall. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the co-founder and executive director of This Is My Brave. This is a pretty surreal moment for us tonight because we're back in front of a live audience after COVID shut everything down last March. I'd like to begin first by recognizing those who made this event possible. First and foremost, we are so thankful to the Flores UMC Restoration Church community for partnering with us at This Is My Brave to bring this unique storytelling event to your September Story Church. We've acknowledged many of you in the playbill, but I would like to say your names. Reverend Tom Berlin, Reverend Barbara Miner, Megan Dietrich, Tasha Campbell, Katie Rakestraw, Alexis Dodi, or Dodi, I'm sorry, Alexis, um, Dylan Nichols, and the leadership at Restoration Reston, Reverends Daniel and Israel Park, uh, Matthew Na, and Pastor Jake at Restoration Loudon, as well as all the members of the following teams at Flores that have collaborated to make this evening a success. 
facilities, AV, communications, the band, the youth group leaders. This night would not have been possible without your hard work, so thank you. We'd also like to thank our local sponsors for tonight, Oak Hill Psychological, Sterling Behavioral Health, Potomac Psychological Center, North Spring Behavioral Healthcare, Wegmans, who loves Wegmans here? They catered the whole weekend, and our friends at Our Minds Matter, who will be leading the teen discussion immediately following the show, down in the hangar. Plus, a special shout out to authors who have mailed us their books, including Dr. Margaret Rutherford, author of per Perfectly Hidden Depression, and Dr. Laura Fielding, who is the author of Mastering Ad Adulthood. We'll be handing out one gift bag per family um, at the end of the night, so don't forget to grab yours as you head out. And some of the bags, uh, most all of them, include a Brave t-shirt. Um, no one could have ever imagined what 2020 had in store for us. To say it has been an extremely difficult year and a half would be an understatement. Beginning with the eruption of the coronavirus and isolation of stay-at-home orders, these past 18 months have been unprecedented and a struggle in many different ways. Thankfully, we were able to pivot our programming and we took everything virtual. And we kicked off 2021 with our first ever Stories from the Black Community shows. They were virtual. In March and April, we presented our second season of This Is My Brave College Edition. And to cap off a busy mental health month, we presented our first ever national teen show virtually. Tonight, six of our 10 brave teens take the stage right here tonight for a special encore performance. Our, uh, hold on, I read that. Oh, no. Our 2021 programming represents our commitment to raising awareness of mental health issues among teens, young adults, and marginalized communities, despite our inability to gather together in theaters with live audiences. I am so grateful to the production teams at Principal Pictures, and this is my brave for going above and beyond to make this show happen. Many, many hours of hard work have gone into creating tonight's brave experience. I am incredibly honored that Arna, Abby, Deja, Jada, Joe, and River, plus Hyra Bakaja, who is an alumni from last year's virtual teen show, um, you'll hear from her later, um, have come from across the country to be together tonight to share their powerful stories. I know that their stories will bring a new understanding of navigating mental health challenges as a teen. Especially now, creating conversations around mental health among young people will have a lasting impact as we evolve from this difficult year and a half. For those of you who don't know me personally, a little bit about my story. I thought my life was over when I was diagnosed with type 1 bipolar disorder 15 years ago at the age of 26. For me, that rock bottom was the beginning of what eventually would become something beautiful, only I didn't know it at the time. It would get worse before it got better. Back then, isolated and afraid for my future, I wondered if life were worth living at all. After back-to-back -back manic episodes, I'd experienced a horrible year of clinical depression and two more manic episodes when I was having my children. Twice, I had to be involuntarily committed to a psychiatric hospital, taken from my home in handcuffs by a police officer because I didn't want to expose my babies to the medicine. Thankfully, I did not let my struggle define me. Through blogging, I found recovery and the beauty and power in sharing my story. The National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, reports that 50% of all lifetime mental illnesses developed by age 14 and 75% developed by age 24. If you didn't know, suicide is currently the second leading cause of death among our young people ages 10 to 24. If these statistics don't light a fire in your belly to help address this mental health crisis, I don't know what will. Because the truth is, every day, over 3,000 high school age students attempt suicide. We need to be talking about this. This is my brave teens, and this show here tonight is a way to show students that they're not alone in their struggles. There is help out there and treatment can work, and that talking openly about these things is a good place to start. 
We've been partnering with Our Minds Matter for the past several years because they also know that lives can be saved by shining a light on true inspiring stories of recovery from students who are not only surviving, but thriving. And this is what you're gonna see tonight. This is our very first national teen show made up of all high school students. These incredible students have come together to bring their stories to the stage because they know that it gets better and they can inspire their peers. It's okay to not be okay. Okay, so three years ago, I was at a show in Boise, Idaho for our show there. After the last audience member had left the venue, our videographers, Carly and Braden, a husband and wife team who had been filming for us for three years in a row, were packing up their equipment. And before they left, Carly, with tears in her eyes, hugged me and said, Jen, I have no doubt in my mind that the work you're doing is changing the world. And then she told me her story. Because if I've learned one thing in the past eight years that I've been doing this work, it's that when one person shares their story, it gives others permission to do the same. That's what we call brave multiplying brave. Which is why I'm so glad you guys are here tonight. So our brave teens are now joining a community of our storytellers from all over the US and Australia who've decided to be brave and put their stories out there nearly a thousand of them. And we have a couple alumni in the audience. If you're an alumni from This Is My Brave, raise your hand. We got a couple of them here. We've had, um, this is our 82nd show tonight. This Is My Brave's vision is to get to a place where we no longer have to call it brave for talking openly about these issues. We believe it should simply be called talking. So now I'm going to stop talking so we can start the show. <laughs> it's weird the way our bodies work. When a moving object comes out of nowhere, there's two typical reactions. You either move out of the way or you get hit. But what happens when the moving object comes out of nowhere? That's the funny thing about trauma. It comes out of nowhere. It comes when you least expect it. It comes and it hits you right in the middle of the road, leaving you with nothing to do but get hit. It's just collision. They don't warn you about the pain. They don't tell you about the aftermath. There's just diagnosis. They don't tell you how you'll end up standing in the police station at 14 years old filing a report. Instead, they tell you to move on. They tell you to get it together because lots of people have it worse than you do. So you develop an eating disorder. You get OCD, PTSD, depression, anxiety, the lists go on, the labels go on. You become someone you don't recognize as self-harm takes over your body. You start to ponder life. You become the person you promised yourself you wouldn't until you aren't her anymore. You learn to fight. You learn to slowly love the process of healing. You become the person that you needed when you were younger. You become an advocate. So here you are speaking out for those in favor of battling mental illness. Here you are surrounded with nothing but love, appreciating the timeline of how you got to where you are. Here you are sharing your story, speaking out. Here you are strong as ever. This is you, the same little girl who dreamed of being on Broadway, the same girl speaking out today, wanting to become a mental health advocate. My name is Abigail Scully, and this is my brave. She's going home If I lay me down Bow my head onto the ground Would you
just can't find the words to say Cold where I lay It's cold where I lay Bones cracked to clay A killer's in the way Hot is my shame And fire pulls my veins I am Deja Montoya. I'm an African-American teenage girl. I'm 16 years old. I'm at the point in life where I need to ask myself, what do I want to do with my life? I've been asking myself this question ever since I was nine years old. I am a dancer. I'm an actress. I am a model. I am a singer. I'm a sociologist. I'm a linguist. I'm an author of five books and many poems that have not been published yet. Isn't this something that's rather astonishing for just a 16-year-old to have? If so, why did these talents take me through so much torture? I have lost best friends over my love for dancing. I have lost friends over my love for learning Chinese. I have earned judgmental looks over my height. I have earned a lot of things that I did not deserve. Because of this, I went to school alone. I turned my back to the smirks, to the laughter, yet I could still feel the piercing pain of words mark my back. I felt too weak to face the teenagers that made fun of me. They stripped me of my confidence. They tore away my happiness. They wiped off my smile. They took away my voice, all because of my hobbies. And now that I'm a homeschool student, did the torture really stop? I still suffer the harsh rippings of negativity. There was one person who was passed the baton with the title of bully. They hurt me, yet they love me. The piece that I'm going to be reading is rather a letter or a note to Deja. I have a few questions for her and a few promises. I hope you can see her sincerity for what it is. You, you don't know what I've been through. He doesn't know, she doesn't know, and they don't know. No idea, no clue, and no wonder of my tears, the cries, the pleas and the begs, my insecurity, my judgment, my non-existent confidence. You just don't know. My name is Deja, and you don't know. I can't be someone who doesn't speak Chinese. I can't be someone who's normal or who fits in. I can't be someone who can keep an indoor voice. <laughs> I'm Deja. Who else do you want me to be? I've tried for so long to be someone, but I don't know who I was trying to be. I felt lost, and anything I did was wrong in their eyes. If I bought lunch to school, it would be seaweed or noodles, and they would take it from my hands, eat it, or throw it on the ground. I had nothing to eat that day. And I'm sorry if I'm an immature teenager who cries too much, but it's literally all I know to do when I'm hurting, when I'm in pain. For years, no one could see my tears. Or maybe 
they just ignored them, or maybe I just ignored them. <laughs> but why? They gave me the attention I wanted, yes, but the words that I didn't. I was alone. I had preferred to be insulted <laughs> than to be alone. I had grown to be so casted out that I was just desperate for anyone to be by my side. Like, if having the Nazi symbol drawn on me, I would be spoken to, then I would allow it. I would try different personas. Eyebrow fill, colorful eyeshadow, bright red lipstick, lash extensions, hobbies, words, slangs, just anything that I heard other teens use, but it was never enough. At the end of the day, I was still that same weak person in everyone's eyes. I was weird, abnormal, strange, a black girl, yeah, an Asian wannabe, obsessed with Asians, addicted to them, loud, obnoxious, worthless, not once to be, but was that really who I was? Or was I just Deja? Am I just Deja? The girl who sat alone in the bathroom for lunch calling my mom on the phone so I wouldn't be alone. Because that's all I ever was, alone. They laughed at me. And they spoke about me. And they insulted me. And they belittled me and they ignored me. They would record me in classrooms, calling me words that no one should ever be called. She sent Melissa's messages to my phone using her friend's kick account. She would speak loudly whenever she was near me, boasting about her crush. But I was just Deja. But she didn't know. My, my first grade teacher didn't know. She didn't know that I was being lied on. She didn't know that the girl pushed me. She didn't know that I was telling the truth, that I was pleading and begging for her to believe me because I was being lied on and I was being in trouble. But she didn't believe me. I begged her to, but she didn't. She never did. And she still doesn't know. But the girl who provoked me knows. And the boy who tried pressuring me into sending news. And the girl who made threats behind my back. And the boys who pushed me down the stairs knew. They all knew who I was, who I am, and that's why they bullied me. That's why they hurt me. I never did anything to them. <laughs> but they knew how special I was. Like a rose growing out of concrete how capable I was, what I was worth. But I never knew myself. But you don't. So I'm telling you who Deja is. This is who I am. I can be weird, but I'm different. Like a rainbow eucalyptus. I can be strange, but I'm inimitable. Like the purest gem in a cave. I'm not perfect, but I am precious, like a dainty rose in a storm. I speak Chinese. I sew, I dance, I model, I act, and I sing, and I'm loud, and I think that's awesome. <laughs> I've always shone my way through every fake persona I try to wear. And now, today, no one can use me against me anymore. After spending so much time with myself in quarantine, I've grown to love the way I spam my keyboard when writing a short story. I learned to love how I smile when singing in a foreign language. I love the way I think, talk, act, and smile. I love it all. I love me. <laughs> This is who I am. That's Deja. This is Deja. I'm Deja. She's Deja. And this is who I want to be.
Up next is River Evans, and I wanted to give you a quick um, intro to River's intro video. In the bulletin tonight, or in your playbill, I mean, uh, page two, there is a um, preview of our upcoming documentary called Brave Teens, and River will be one of the teens that is featured in that documentary. So we thought we'd share with you tonight a small clip from that show, from that film, and it is also River's intro. So here we go with River Evans. You know, in third grade, when I would go to art class, we had crayons, and then we had oil pastels, and I remember taking one out of the box, and this was a very unsafe thing to do, but I would rub it on my lips and act like it was lipstick, and one of my friends, we were talking about it, and I was like, I don't know, I just feel a lot better when I feel like I'm wearing makeup. And he said, oh, so do you feel like you're supposed to be a girl? And I told him, I said, yeah. He was like, so then you're trans. And I was like, yeah, I guess I am. I wrote my first song while I was in the hospital. And that was when I realized that music was the biggest help. What did I say to turn you on? The most important thing isn't even about how I look. A lot of it is about the language. Referring to someone with the correct pronouns, referring to them by their name, even if it's not legal yet, like the small social parts of it. I wish they realized that those were more important than, to me than all the clothes and my hair. Okay, no, my hair is the most important thing. The social aspect comes second. It's not a choice. You left the scar over my heart. I do know that it's time for me to start to love myself. And it's time for me to learn to take care of me. Hid it from the world, the scars they couldn't see. And I can't let this go until my cup is empty. I'll fill it up again, then drink the night away. I do it to feel numb because I know I'm not okay. My anxiety haunts me through the night time. My sobriety is so far out of sight Where can I go when the dark consume the light? My anxiety You held me close to you No matter what I did And I don't know what I did right To deserve all of this and I know it hurts you when I drink the night away. I'm tired of feeling numb. I just want to be okay. But my anxiety haunts me in the night. And my sobriety is so far out of sight. Where can I go? Will the dark consume the light? My anxiety. I was punished for something I can't control. Pushed away when they saw I wasn't whole. He left this hole. So now. My anxiety still haunts me in the night, but my sobriety is not too far out of sight. And I know where to run, the dark can't hide from light, my sobriety. Cause
because my anxiety haunts me through the night, but my sobriety is not too far out of sight. I know where I can go and I will be the night, my sobriety. I'll make it through the night. I'll make it through the night. And I will be all right. Stay sober one more night. Oh. Cause my anxiety may haunt me through the night. But my sobriety is not that far out of sight. And I know where to go, the dark can't run from light, my anxiety. I'll make it through the night. Hello, my name is Anna Dixit, she, her pronouns, and I'm a senior at Sunset High School in Portland, Oregon. I currently live on the stolen lands of the Kalats, Atfalati, and Kalapuya tribes. Before this, I lived in India and I moved to the US halfway through my freshman year. My Hindu identity is a huge part of who I am and that spirituality has been a big coping mechanism when it comes to my mental health journey. Poetry has definitely been my main coping mechanism because it allows me to express what I'm feeling, and I've been writing poetry since my freshman year, since I really started struggling with my mental health. I invalidated my emotions a lot, I bottled up my emotions, and that was my main block towards healing. I didn't allow myself to recognize and acknowledge my emotions. Poems kind of chart my experience of healing, like the parts where I'm really struggling and when I'm feeling really dark, and the parts where I'm still struggling, but I'm feeling more optimistic, when it comes to my healing. I think one of the main things that really helped me was volunteering with the Oregon Youth Line because that community of peers and professionals really allowed me to reflect and recognize my own mental health struggles. I believe that I'm going to heal. I'm looking forward to the future. I feel more optimistic than I do pessimistic. In fact, I think I am a more optimistic person in general. And even though I'm struggling, I have full belief that I can get through it. And I think that's the thing that's really helped me in my healing journey. Hello everyone, I'm just gonna be reading a collection of original poems, all of which are untitled. It's too much, the chaos within me, the horrors around me. I'm numb, unfeeling, because I fear feeling all at once may be my destruction. I refuse to be a controlled and managed picture of perfection. I refuse to be the happy, jolly person society wants me to be. I'm a bundle of emotions, raw and undiluted. I feel with every fiber of my being. I feel happiness and sadness. I am confidence and anxiety. I'm not one thing or the other. I am an amalgamation of the emotions inside me. I cannot be controlled. I am a force to be reckoned with. I thought it was my fault, all of it, the way I was, the way I thought, the fire and darkness burning in me. But no, it is not my fault that the world can't handle the way I burn. The porcelain of the tub cools my skin as the water rushes down upon me, the sound of it drowning out everything, every thought 
every worry is washed away as the drops slide down every inch of me, the force of the water gentle yet unrelenting. I feel awake, alive. The darkness covers me like a blanket. The air warm as the stars above me sing a lullaby. And the power of the universe is like music in my veins. I am one with the water, fluid and fierce. I am everything all at once. I am whatever I want to be. I am a force to be reckoned with. I am one with the fire, passionate and resilient. I feel with every inch of myself. I live every day. I'm one with the air, liberated and imaginative. I'm a dreamer who looks to the stars. I fly high with my wings spread wide. I'm one with the earth, compassionate and humble. I hurt for others. I love ferociously. I fight for change. I'm one with the energies of this world. I am love and hate. I am sadness and joy. I am power itself. Some days I feel alive and everything has been worth it. I'm ready to conquer destiny. Yet some days I am lost, stumbling around to find my way back into the light. Those days I don't want to get out of bed. Some days I think it's over, it's done, I'm cured now. But that twisting sensation comes back, reminding me I can't be cured and that I don't need to be. Hi, I'm Joe, and this is a little bit about me. I love being outside, hiking, fishing, rock climbing, whatever it is. As long as I'm outside, I am in my element. I'm a senior in high school, specifically in Gahanna, Ohio. Go Lions. I suppose I should address the elephant in the room, mental illness. I've struggled with mental illness since the seventh grade. ADHD, anxiety, depression, self-harm, suicidal ideation, the list goes on and on, oh my God. But that's not what matters. What matters is that I'm still kicking and I'm here telling my story. But why am I telling my story? There are a few reasons. Specifically, for me. The guy who's been there, done that. For Kim, my longtime friend and also longtime safety net, which admittedly went both ways sometimes. For TJ, from the hospital, the best poet I ever met. For Gabe and Addison, my hospital homies, who witnessed me at my worst and my poetry at its best. Funny how that works. More generally, I'm doing this for that kid. You know. Well, actually, probably you don't. That's why I'm here. To tell him that it's okay to tell you. To have a conversation. That doesn't mean I have to like where I'm at. In fact, if I could cut ties with my illness, I think I'd do it. Probably write it some sort of breakup letter. Or declaration of independence of sorts. Wonder what it'd look like. First, I want to say uh, that video is. Just a little outdated, I'm in college now. What's not outdated, I am wearing the same sweatshirt that was in that video. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Dear, ah, I wish I could do this. There we go. Dear my mental illness, this, this just isn't working out here, you know? I mean, we should probably see other people, to be honest. It isn't 
actually me. This, this is definitely you. Um, <laughs> now, we all know that, that breaking up, as it were, with, with mental illness, just like any disease, isn't that easy. But what if? So I did. I wrote a letter. Um, it ended up as more of a poem. I know, another poet who deal with it. Because <laughs> um, that's just kind of my style, poetry. So here is my poem, A Letter to My Mental Illness. Dear My Mental Illness, when you first took hold, I was okay with it. But then your embrace grew cold, the friendliness faded, and I realized I needed out, out of this hole that you had dug before it became my grave. But every time I tried, I just, I fell back in. So I just gave up. I didn't say a word, and I watched while you silently destroyed my world. But now, a flurry of my furious words fill the page, ink leaving blood like stains on the paper, while my shouts fill the stage and ideas are leaking from my brain. You thought this was over. You thought you had me cornered. You thought you had crushed me. You thought incorrectly. Because I think I've found my way now. And I think I've found a way out. And this is me fighting back. Frantically forming some semblance of an attack on your hideous ways. It's been planned. Well thought out and calculated. Everything you do is deliberate. And so everything I do has to be two. You thought you would be the death of me. I think with some time you'll come to see how backwards you had that. I will have my revenge. I'll kill you like the snake you are. How will you bite with no head? <laughs> You've lived in mine for far too long, but I'm smarter. I know your tricks. I'm stronger than I ever was. Strong enough to finally turn this page in my story to a new chapter. And that's a first for me. But it's a last for you. So come face me yourself, you coward. That's all you are, a rat, a weasel, but you no longer control what I feel or what I do, and I will crush you underfoot like the dirt you are, and I can do it too. Because I'm not alone. No. I'm not alone. There are people who want to hear my story told, but not yours. No, not yours. You have had the floor. For the past five years, you've been giving me the fight of my life and fighting you. It isn't easy. There have been times where it takes all I have, sometimes nearly more, collapsed to the floor, a heap of sobbing mess, and what am I alive for. And I know you'll never willingly leave me. I know that. And that will probably always displease me, but I think I can settle for being a mountain and you just a pebble. A fly on the wall that I can't quite swat. Just yet. Sincerely, Joe. My name is Jada Bromberg. I'm 17 years old, and I live in Fairfax, Virginia. The first word that always pops into my head when thinking about my experiences in life is why. What's the reason behind it? For months at a time, I would feel depressed from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep. Anxiety took over my mind and body, and the light at the end of the tunnel quickly seemed to fade out. All I wanted was for my emotional pain to go away, for my thoughts to silence to feel peace and be riding an ocean's wave rather than sinking under it. I felt so bad on the inside that making myself hurt on the outside, I believed, was the only way to cope. 
I've been in therapy for four years and I've worked hard every single day to get where I am now. I was in denial for three of those years that being relinquished by my birth parents as an infant was traumatic. Trauma lives in a person's body. It lives in mine. No matter how fortunate I am, nothing can take away my beginning. No one thing makes me unworthy or unlovable. I was in denial, but now I am learning to accept. Hiding how I felt only made me feel worse and alone. Speaking out about my journey, which is continuously changing, and becoming a passionate mental health advocate has lifted the biggest weight off my shoulders. More specifically, music and writing my own songs is how I express myself and is also my number one coping skill to this day. I've been singing my entire life, quite literally, as I sang my first notes on a bus ride in China, shortly after my parents held me for the first time, at just 13 months old. My journey has not been easy, and nor will it be in the future, but even having gone through the hardest parts, I'm still here. Stop and think that I'm lying to myself. Should probably get some help. I'm waiting on you to tell me I'm worthy of love. I'm waiting on you to believe I'm not messed up. Promise the truth to myself. clears I'm still fresh air. I'm waiting on you to tell me I'm worthy of love. I'm waiting on you to believe I'm not messed up. Promise the truth to myself, not you. Who's here to tell me
Can we please take a moment to give one more rousing round of applause to our brave team? Thank you. You guys stand, please. Thank you. My name is Erin Gallagher. I'm a program manager at This Is My Brave and a former member of Flores UMC. To my dear friends here at Flores and all of you who are tuning in via live stream this evening from across the country, I wanna thank you for joining us this evening for this momentous occasion, our first time in front of a live audience since March of 2020. You know, over the past 18 months, each of us at the Brave staff have had our own moment when the realities of the COVID-19 pandemic finally took us down. I was the last one among us to be overcome by the crushing, crushing blow. Not to suggest that I'm the strongest, I just might be the one who's most deeply in denial. <laughs> My breakdown moment came this past May while watching this national team show air virtually in, in May. Watching this cast of teens share their stories on a computer screen just felt like such a letdown. I felt for them that they deserved to have the opportunity to tell their stories on stage, to feel the energy of a live audience, to be affirmed and celebrated for what they've accomplished in their lives. Tonight, thanks to all of you, and the generous efforts of this church community, our brave cast was able to shine a light on a topic we just don't talk enough about. I'd like to take a moment right now to ask all of you in the audience to be brave with us. And if you are able to please stand, if you yourself have experienced a mental health disorder in your lifetime, or if you have loved someone who has. Take a look around. There's a lot of people standing. Thank you. This part of our show, this part where we invite people to stand, is always an overwhelming moment for me. As many of you know, I lost my son, Jay, five years ago to suicide. He died in large part because the stigma of mental illness made him feel alone, like he was the only person in the world who was struggling. I wish that Jay could have seen a brave show. I wish that Jay could have heard story after story of people who are living well and thriving despite their mental illnesses. I wish that Jay could have seen an entire audience of people stand in response to that statement. Maybe then he would have realized he wasn't alone, that he didn't have to suffer in silence, 
that there was a way through what he was facing. Here's something that I wish all of you would take away from tonight. Something that we say all the time at This Is My Brave, and we believe with our whole hearts. Storytelling saves lives. So I have a challenge for all of you. You may not have a desire to get up on stage with us at This Is My Brave as a storyteller. You may not have a desire to stand on stage and be a storyteller during Story Church at Flores, but that's okay. You can still tell your story or share one you heard tonight to start conversations in your circles and keep the conversations going. This is how we will stem the tide of silent suffering and teen suicide, by bringing the topic of mental health and mental illness out of the shadows and into the bright light of our daily conversations. This is how we will give hope to those who need it the most so that they can get the help they need. I'm inviting you to make a difference in the same way that our brave teens are. We can all make a difference, and we will. One person and one story at a time. Thank you. And now I turn it back over to Megan to sing our brave theme song, Tell Them I'm Brave. I'd love it if you guys would sing with us. I thought there was no way out. by doubt I'd forgotten what freedom was like puzzle pieces on the floor they don't fit 
I'm Tom Berlin. I'm one of the pastors here. And I, I just want to thank you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to catch everything that they're thinking and say part of it. Thank you. Thank you for your words. Thank you for your dance. Thank you for your music. Thank you for your, your poetry, for your thoughtfulness. Thank you for your honesty. I mean, being honest in front of a group of people, you don't, you don't know who they are. But you come up here and you're, you're willing to be brave. And that is a powerful thing. But it's powerful for us to watch. And you laced your bravery and your words with hope. And trust me, everybody here, me included, we need to know that there's hope on a healing journey. We need to know that there's a light at the end of a tunnel, and you gave us stories of that light. And for that, we want to honor you, and we want to thank you, and I'd just like to ask you to take one last bow, because that was fantastic. And and now what we're going to do is um, split into two directions. So let me tell you about that. We have panel discussions. They're going to start at 8.15, which is very soon. Very, very soon. The adults will be in here. The students will be in the fellowship hall. If you go out of this room toward the rock wall, you'll see the doors go into the fellowship hall. That's where the student panel will be. If there are students that would feel more comfortable staying with their parents, stay right here. You're welcome to be on the adult side. But the, the room with the fellowship hall is going to be students only, with the exception of a few adults that are, that are sort of managing the, the program there. So the two panels will be in those two locations. We want to thank, again, all those who contributed tonight. But I, I tell you, stay for the panel panel because you're going to get information and insights that are going to be fresh and new and it's going to make the evening whole. So thank you and let's move now into those two spaces, the adults here, the students in the fellowship hall.